So far in this series, we've covered the theory behind basic surface attack. But if you really want to understand this material, you're going to need some hands-on practice. In this video, we'll go over how the U.S. Air Force practices BSA. The Air Force teaches two different patterns to teach surface attack, the conventional pattern and the tactical pattern. In this video, we'll cover the conventional pattern in depth, and in a following video, we'll go over the tactical one. The conventional pattern is actually laid out just like your overhead landing pattern, with the only real difference being that instead of landing, you're going to be dropping ordnance and then pulling up to your pattern altitude for a follow-on run on the target. That pullout is known as a safe escape maneuver, or SEM for short, and in the publication, it is defined as a two-second blend to a 4G pullout. Each leg of the pattern has certain tasks that need to be accomplished. On the crosswind, you want to get visual on your flight and fix spacing. Correct spacing is defined as between six and 9,000 feet, or enough that a flight of four would occupy each corner of the pattern. On the downwind, you're mentally going to go over any errors you had on your previous run, and then prepare for the most important leg of the pattern, which is the base. On your base leg, you want to make sure that your position is good, and you want to refine all the parameters that we discussed previously. Any errors you have on your base will follow you into the final and affect your final accuracy. While you're out at the range, there are a few radio calls you're going to want to make to help the rest of your flight maintain situational awareness. The first of these calls is a base call, and this is to let your flight members know that you're turning onto the base leg of the pattern. It sounds like this, Eagle 2's base. Next, you'll want to let them know that you're turning on to final with an in call. That sounds like this, Eagle 2's in. If for whatever reason you don't drop ordnance on the target, then after the safe escape maneuver, you'll go and make an off dry call along with the reason why you didn't drop that ordnance. It sounds like this, Eagle 2's off dry parameters. And in that case, you're letting your flight know that you were off on your parameters on the way in and therefore decided not to drop ordnance. On a real life range, you would have a range control officer that would be responsible for giving you clearance before you can drop ordnance. The way that would work is after you made your in call, the range control officer would give you a cleared hot call if you're cleared to drop live ordnance, or a continued dry call if you're just going to simulate an attack run. In either case, you want to stay off the radio until the range control officer has made that cleared hot or continued dry call. So after you hear somebody say call sign in, you're going to wait until the range control officer talks. If you had to delay one of your calls because you were waiting on the range control officer to go give a cleared hot call, then you would just preface your next call with the word late. So if you're about to turn in base and you already did and you're waiting, you would just say late Eagle 2 base. Lastly, if you want to know where somebody's at in the pattern, you could just uh, ask them by saying Eagle 2 say pause it and then Eagle 2 would respond by saying Eagle 2 is in the downwind. Now if you're going to be flying the range solo then you don't really need to make these radio calls. But it's good to know them because eventually you're going to be flying with the team and the foundation for good teamwork is good communication. Let's take a look how we can go and put all these skills together and put them into practice inside DCS. Here's a simple BSA range that I put together around the airport at Batumi. On the left we have our base leg which runs roughly down the coast, but really we're going to be using these fires with these tall smoke columns as our reference points. The final leg runs roughly down this river and it ends at this island that has a small group of structures that's going to act as our target. After you make a successful bombing run, you could just do your safe escape mover, turn left, and then re-enter the pattern for another run again. And you would just keep repeating this pattern so you can practice your skills. This range is conveniently located at sea level, and that's so that students that are practicing their basic surface attack skills don't need to worry about messing with the altimeter. They can just practice marksmanship and flying the pattern. And that's why I created a second map on the Nevada range, which happens to be a few thousand feet above sea level. Let's take a look at that. This range is set up around a location known as Dogbone Lake, which is actually a real-life U.S. Air Force bombing range. 
our targets are at 3,400 feet above sea level, which means that we're going to have to make some adjustments if we want to go and fly a base leg that's 7,000 feet above them. So we'll either have to fly at 10,400 feet above sea level or adjust our altimeter to match the altitude of our targets. So just like with the Batumi range, we have some convenient landmarks that we can use to line ourselves up while we're flying this pattern. While flying the downwind, we'll be using this mountain range right here to line ourselves up and get ready for turning onto our base. There are also two lines of shipping containers that are used as range markers. The one on the left indicates one mile from the targets. The one on the right indicates two miles from the targets. We'll be lining ourselves up on the two mile mark for our base leg. These miles are nautical miles, which are about 6,000 feet apiece. So knowing that we're going to be about two miles from the target when we roll in, we know that our ground track is going to be about 12,000 feet to the target. Using our example from earlier, we know that a 7,000 foot altitude means that we're going to have about a 14,000 foot slant range, which is twice our altitude whenever we go into a 30 degree dive. This fits in nicely with our 12,000 foot ground track because we would expect our slant range to be slightly longer than our ground track range, which it is in this case. So now that we know we're on the right track, let's go over a few tips to make sure that you have a good rolling technique to get you on a good final. There are nine possible places you can be on your base leg, but only one of them is the correct one. You can be too high, too low, or off to the side. You get to the right place by being at the correct altitude, flying towards your pre-planned landmark, and lastly you refine your position using canopy codes. A canopy code is simply a part of your aircraft that you use as a physical reference point to help get oriented. Here we can see some of the canopy codes for the T-38. When a target is lined up with the rail of the T-38, we know that it's at a 30 degree angle. These canopy codes also work in the F-5 within DCS. Here we see several targets that are lined up with the rail of the F-5 and all of them are on a 30 degree dive angle. One thing to remember with canopy codes is that your head does need to be centered for them to be accurate. So if you're slouching in your seat or moving to the left or the right, you might not get an accurate read. As you're getting ready to roll in on final, you want to do a set of checks collectively known as the whammo checks to ensure that your aircraft is properly set up for an attack. Whammo is a mnemonic to help us remember all of the checklist items we need to cover during these checks. In this video, we'll cover steps that are specific to the F-5. Just remember that the Air Force teaches that WAMO checks help the aircrew develop habit patterns that can be applied in future aircraft. The first part of our WAMO check is checking the weapons mode. So if we're going to drop a bomb, we need to make sure that the, the pylon that the bomb is on is active, that bomb mode is selected on the rotary knob, and that the fuse is armed. Next, we want to make sure our master arm is set correctly. The F5 doesn't have a true master mode, but the gun sight does. So we're going to go and switch that gun sight to manual mode and then dial in the proper depression that we need for our dive angle. The last part of the WAMO checklist that we do before our final is the ops check. And this is simply looking over your gauges to make sure that your plane isn't sick. The error analysis portion of our checklist is something that we save for after we've completed our safe escape maneuver. All this is is a quick mental review of any mistakes you made in your previous run. So here we are lined up neatly on our base leg with our target off to the left. At this point we're going to focus on getting our altitude and our airspeed within target parameters. First we're going to activate the bomb pylon, set the master arm on, set the fuse, and put our external stores on the correct setting. That'll take care of the W and the A in our WAMO check, so next we're going to work on the master mode. Here we're going to go and put the gun sight into manual mode, and then enter in the correct amount of depression into our gun sight. Next we'll do an ops check by looking over all the gauges on the right side of our control panel. If everything looks good, we'll continue with our roll-in. Just before roll-in, we want to get a good canopy code picture with our target right on the rail. Announce your roll-in with an in-call over the radio as you turn in on the final leg. 
This is the point where you would expect the response of either cleared hot or continue dry. Now all you should be focusing on is getting that aim point to slowly drift up onto your target. With the release out of the way, now we're going to focus on our safe escape maneuver, which is a 2 second blend to a 4G pullout. As we roll out on the crosswind, we want to try and get visual on any wingmen that we might have in the pattern with this so that we can maintain safe spacing with them. And lastly, we want to do the E of our WAMO checks, which is error analysis. So we'll just quickly go over mentally what we could have done better to make that a more successful bomb run. And then we'll re-enter the pattern and start our base leg once again. There are a few things you need to have squared away if you want to get a good roll in on your target. First, you need your wings to be level on your base, otherwise you're not going to get an accurate canopy code picture. You also need to maintain the same speed on every one of your base legs. The speed on your base leg affects the speed of the release. 400 indicated is a good speed for the F5. Your throttle should also be at the same setting after each attempt to keep things repeatable. In the F5, you should get good results just leaving the throttle and mill power. If you find yourself at more than 5 degrees off your planned dive angle, you should abort the attack. This means that you're really far off your wire and probably won't get accurate results. Lastly, there's no reason to pull the stick into your lap. This will go and result in some wing buffeting, which means you'll lose a lot of speed. You only need to pull to a buffet if you absolutely need to bleed some speed. If you do everything right and stay on your wire, then you should find your aim point will drift up over the target right at your planned release altitude. Let's do a quick recap on the conventional pattern. We start out with the base call as we turn onto the base leg, then we'll find our target and complete our WAMO checks. We'll get our base position and parameters correct by making sure that we're at the correct altitude, the correct speed, and the correct position. And of course, we'll go and cross-check that with our canopy codes to make sure that we're set up correctly before we make our end call and turn on the final. On your final, you're going to wait for a cleared hot call if you have a range control officer available. And then you're just going to let your aim point drift up slowly and gently to the target for a nice, easy, and accurate release. In this video, we covered the conventional surface attack pattern. In the next part of this series, we'll cover the tactical pattern, sometimes called the pop-up pattern. This pattern is used when a traditional high-level approach to the target is too dangerous. If you'd like to practice on the ranges featured in this series, you can download the mission files. Link is in the description. Thanks for watching.